I'm going to take up two examples of graph algorithms and try and explain how they work. Right? One of them is related to the problem of finding the critical path in a circuit, right? which is pretty much what we did in the case of finding out the minimum operating clock period or the maximum operating frequency of a digital circuit. Right? So this is the same circuit that we already saw as an example earlier. And what I'm going to do is sort of systematically go through it and show how you can use the critical path algorithm in order to actually find the length of the critical path and therefore the maximum time that this uh, is required for uh, the, for a signal to go from you know, either an input or a flip-flop output to either the output or to some other flip-flop input. Okay. So the first question that we can ask is how do I represent this netlist which basically consists of gates and flip-flops and wires as a graph. Okay. So what I'm going to do is identify the sort of nodal points. Right, things that make sense to represent as vertices and that basically includes all the gates right, the actual logic combinational gates also includes the fundamental input x and the output y of the uh, system and in addition I am going to treat the inputs and the outputs of flip-flops as separate nodes right. The reason for this is that I Every flip-flop is sort of acting as a break in my chain for me, right? Because as you know, whatever arrives at the input D1 does not go through to Q1 until a clock edge arrives, right? So if I think of the clock edges as sort of partitioning time into different segments, then I never have some uh, time segment where there is data directly going from D1 to Q1. Right? Something might change at D1, but it's going to remain over there until the next clock edge comes and only then go to Q1. So for all practical purposes, Q1, any changes in Q1 are happening, sort of not independent, but at a, uh, as far as time is concerned at least, independent of D1. Okay? So because of that, I am going to represent Q1 and D1 as two separate modes. Right? So Q1 is sort of the start of a signal, that's when a signal starts out into the circuit, whereas D1 is the end of a signal, that's when it basically needs to satisfy its setup time constraint and wait over there until the next clock edge. Okay. So this is an example of what uh, the constraint that needs to be satisfied at uh, for the clock edges. Right? So if I look at a clock edge that is going to happen uh, somewhere, right? so this is the location of the clock edge, what I need is that as far as D1 is concerned, a certain amount of time before that clock edge, the data must be stable and is not allowed to change. Right? So that is the T setup. Right? Similarly, for a certain amount of time after the clock edge, Q1 is uncertain. That is to say, I haven't yet got the correct value. That value is the TCQ. And after TCQ, I can guarantee that Q1 now has a stable correct value provided that there were no other violations and so on. So the reason I'm bringing these two up here is because these are the two values that I need to take care of when I'm doing my critical path analysis. I need to add them into the path length. What you will see is that the T hold actually plays no role in the critical path computation. Right? T hold is important but not for finding the critical path. It's important to find out whether there are actual hold time violations. Right? By itself it does not affect the critical path or the maximum operating frequency of the circuit. What I have drawn down there is exactly, you know, I just redrew all those elements x, u0, u1, u2, u3, etc. I have redrawn them as circuits and now I can put the edges in corresponding to them. Right? So from x to u0 for example, there is an edge over here. Similarly, right, this corresponds to this edge. Right. Similarly, there is an edge from u naught uh, u naught to u three, which is basically this edge, and so on. Right. So in this way, you can see that I can basically add all the edges into the system. What I have not drawn is where the Q values go. Right. So the Q outputs basically take the uh, signals. So for example, I have this from the output of the flip-flop, 
going into u1 and similarly from the output of the other flip flop going to u0 right and you will notice that there is a clean break over here right t and q have no connection the way that i have drawn right so this sort of makes it very clear that they correspond to i mean the q in other words is after the clock edge has arrived this is the time taken uh, this is how the output arrives and then goes into the rest of the circuit whereas d2 is where it finally comes terminates and waits for the next clock edge okay. so now how do we do a critical path analysis how do we find out what is the constraint on the time period let's draw this chart that i have shown over here right so you have x you not have basically put every single node down and have a time axis going along uh, towards the right okay and what i'm going to do is how would we do this analysis right i need to basically find out when can signals possibly come into the system and how long is it going to be until they exit the system right so i right now i need to find out which are all the nodes that can potentially execute or you know that don't have any other dependencies and therefore i'm just going to take some amount of time and give me an output okay now the first thing to notice what do i do with x right this is an external input i don't really know when it can change this is not in my control so i have to assume something i'm going to assume that it changes or whatever has a valid value at t equal to 0 okay the other values the other nodes that can basically start out are also you know highlighted in green over here they basically correspond to so all three of them if i look at them it basically corresponds to x q1 and q2 okay these are the possible nodes that can execute to start with so you know this term that i'm using execute is probably a little bit more valid in the context later that we will come across you know actual functions that execute and so on over here these are logic gates they don't really have any notion of executing or starting and stopping and so on so what i actually mean over here is when i say that q1 is ready to execute all that it means is okay a clock edge arrived and a certain amount of time later the data comes out that's what you can see here right so a clock edge arrived at t equal to 0 right and at t equal to 3 q1 and q2 both have their values right now at t equal to 0 itself x has its correct value because i'm assuming that there is no delay associated with x okay all right so now what do i do i basically know that these three things are now out of the picture right x i already know that there is something present at its output at time equal to 0 q1 it takes some amount of time for the data after the clock edge for the data to actually be present at q1 how much is that time 3 nanoseconds because i assumed tcq was 3 nanoseconds right so these are the same numbers that i assumed in the last class while analyzing the timing right so just for reference what i'm going to do is tcq is equal to 3 t setup is equal to 2 xor is equal to 3 and is equal to 2 and uh, the inverter not is equal to 1 right so these are numbers that i'm assuming so with all of this in mind what do i do now i have basically you know uh, handled x q1 and q2 which means that i now need to find out what else is now ready to go right and if i move forward the best way to do that is delete all those edges corresponding to x q1 and q2 right say that i have already sort of taken care of them and now i find that this node u0 right suddenly does not have any input dependencies why did that happen because it actually had these two inputs right both of which were deleted by my process of getting rid of the edges after processing x and q2 right which basically made u0 to be something which is ready to go at this point and if i look at this graph what i'll find is that it has two dependencies one is from x2 right and the uh, one is from q2 and the other is from x right of the two which one which signal can i say arrived later the one from q2 because it arrived at time 3 okay and from 3 onwards i take 2 nanoseconds right because this has a delay of 
okay and i find that it basically ends at time equal to 5 okay so u0 has now also been taken care of i know exactly when u0 executes go forward still delete the edges going out of u0 now what i find is u1 and u3 have in degree equal to 0 no dependencies right they are ready to go so I'll mark them and i process u1 and u3 u1 for example where are its inputs coming from from u0 and from q1 right so there's one from u0 and from u1 right it turns out that the one from u0 is the one which takes which arrives later right it arrives at time 5 plus 3 so the ending time of u1 is now 8 right as far as u3 is concerned the ending time of u3 is 6 okay go forward still more right delete the edges going out of u1 and u3 and uh, yeah in fact uh, q2 was also well no q2 was already taken care of now what i find is all the others right so t1 u2 y all are ready to go okay so let's take them one at a time what i can find is if i look at d1 right it basically has a dependency on u1 right that is to say d1 basically gets its out uh, gets the input from u1 right and in addition to that as far as d1 is concerned i need to add on another two nanoseconds which is the setup time corresponding to d1 because that will be the final time at which the data is now ready to be latched into the flip flop okay if I go and look now instead at U2, right, it turns out that U2 has dependencies from U1 and from U3, okay. And if I look at both of these, right, and then add the time required for it, 8 plus 3, I end up with 11. That is to say, the ending time over here is 11 for U2, okay. And similarly, when I look at this u, uh, sorry, y, it's basically, you know, whatever was the value ready at u3 itself was equal to y. I just marked it as a separate node for the purposes of convenience, but it, there is no additional delay associated with it. So in this case, y is ready at time 6 itself. Okay. Once again, proceed. I delete the edge and find that now d2 is the only one remaining, right? And if I go and draw this, where does D2 come from? From U2, right? So I have this edge out here and I find add the D setup and end up with 13 as the time when D2 is ready. Okay. So in the process, you will see that everything has been completed. I'm done with all of these nodes. Okay. The sync nodes, Y, D1 and D2, right? If I look at them, I find that the longest or the greatest path over here corresponded the end, uh, ending time corresponded to this node over here which is d2 right and if i look closely the path that i followed to get there was i first went through q1 the output of q1 was then taken by u0 right from u0 i went through u1 and then from u1 to u2 and from u2 to d2 until i finally ended up with this as the length of my critical path which is 13 time units okay so what does that tell us essentially let's try and understand this in terms of an algorithm how did we actually do this in a systematic manner right so the algorithm that I'm going to use to describe this is now unlike C++, I'm writing this in something which is closer to Python, but at the end of the day, you should probably just think of it as pseudocode, right? Don't really worry too much about whether it's Python or C or anything else. The inputs to this algorithm are essentially, I need to somehow specify the graph itself, right? So I need to have a graph with V vertices and E edges. If you were actually doing this in Python, V would probably be a list and E could either be a 
two dimensional matrix which is an adjacency matrix which says whether u and v are connected or it could be an adjacency list for every u for every node u it tells you which are all the output nodes v that are connected to it okay and i'm going to assume that this s that i'm uh, using within the algorithm is a set right now how do you implement a set data structure there are complicated ways of doing it but to keep things simple we could also assume it's just an array or even a linked list right so the algorithm itself what was the procedure that we followed over here the first thing we did was we sort of initialize everything right so we have a array called dist which i will initialize all the values to zero to start with. okay and once i have done that i then go through and find all the nodes that have zero in degree to start with. what is zero in degree if you go back and look over here right you will note that it is basically the x q1 and q2 to start with which are the nodes with zero in degree to start with those are the only three nodes with zero in degree right and what i do is for each of those the output i basically set it to be the delay of that particular node itself right so the distance uh, from time zero so to say until the output of the u, of node u is the delay of the node u itself okay now what this means is after i have done this much what does s contain s contains the three values x q1 and q2 right so after the initialization s contains the values x q1 and q2 and as long as s is not empty what i'm going to do is take one value out of s right i'm just calling that as pop and for all the neighbors that is to say the next nodes that are connected to you if the present distance of u plus the delay of v is greater than the present distance of v right i will update the distance of v now why is this the reason i'm doing this is because v might have two inputs okay which arrive at different times the first input that arrives will update it and it will say okay this is the distance of v this is the time when the value of v changes but there might be another u the second input which changes at an even later time which causes v to get updated once again i want to find the maximum among such values which is why i am going on updating this inside the loop okay and once i have updated it i delete the edge how do i delete an edge in a, a graph data structure well there are you know that's one of the things i'm sort of going to hand wave and leave out over here there are ways of doing it efficiently and the interesting thing is i need to check after i have deleted an edge now if the in degree of v has become equal to 0 i add v to s right which means that s is no longer empty okay on the other hand if i go through this entire algorithm find that s becomes empty there are no more nodes to process it means either that i have actually completely found out the critical path or it could mean that somehow there was a loop in this entire graph and i ended up in some place where there was some node whose in degree never became equal to 0 okay how do we analyze this algorithm the main running part of it there's one thing that's over here which is basically going to go over all the neighbors of u which will probably take time proportional to the maximum possible number of neighbors which is v itself or v minus 1 okay similarly the while s not empty so what is s it is a set consisting of vertices every time a vertex is put in it will get processed and will never come back into the value of s okay so the maximum that we can see in other words is i can have v into v so i can end up with order of v squared as the maximum running time everything else if you look carefully at it can be thought of as a elementary operation okay now this algorithm that i have just presented is actually a deterministic polynomial time algorithm that works perfectly for this particular problem 
Now, like I said, the delete and add, I'm going to skip over those and not worry about that. There are ways of doing them efficiently and treat them as elementary operations. So, this, in other words, the critical path was an example of an algorithm that is deterministic and is also guaranteed to give you the correct critical path length. Right? It will give you the correct answer. And it takes O of V squared time. So, O of V squared deterministic and it's optimal. 